One in three Americans feel lonely. Is this a real epidemic? And what can we do about it? Oh my goodness, Andrew. This is Lovid 2024. <gasps> or should I say low? Yeah, l- Lonelyitis. Lonelyvid 2024. Oh my goodness, guys. Uh, let's just roll these news clips. Dr. Vivek Murthy, the U.S. Surgeon General, says loneliness is an epidemic. The focus of an 80-page advisory he is releasing today. We're used to thinking about smoking and obesity as clear public health concerns. So you're saying loneliness is comparable to smoking in terms of the detriment to your health? Yeah, in terms of the risk that it poses for premature death, yes. For many, being older has its perks. You have more time to yourself, but all that time alone can make some people feel, well, lonely. A new report found loneliness is on the rise in the U.S. and one in three Americans over 45 is lonely. That's more than 48 million people. The effect of social isolation and loneliness on our health is as powerful as things like smoking, high blood pressure, obesity. Boom, Andrew! That comes at the advisory of the Surgeon General. He said that loneliness could affect your health as much as almost anything else. All right, so let's talk about why loneliness is bad, and then we're going to talk about what the response is from certain communities. Are Asian Americans lonelier than other people? And what can people do about it, most importantly? So please hit that like button. Check out other episodes of the Hot Pot Boys if you're interested in this topic. And check out Smile Out Sauce at Amazon.com. Listen, guys, Andrew, was Akon right? I'm Mr. Lonely, more lonely than Europeans, <laughs> statistically. Uh, so, David, they say loneliness is bad for your health because it can lead to depression, uh, lead to bad diets, bad habits, heart disease, high pl- blood pressure, mental health issues, thoughts of suicide, unhealthy relationships, etc., cetera, et cetera, guys. Um, obviously, with the rise of social media, gaming, or just the breakdown of communities, which we're all going to talk about. People um, spending too much time on the hub. Yeah. That's what it is. No, but uh, yeah. everybody is talking about it, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and from different angles too, right? Like one article is framing it, uh, middle-aged Americans are lonelier than European counterparts due to social media, internet usage, the suburbs, disconnected, you know, uh, just lack of mass transit, lack of third spaces, Andrew. Why is everybody blaming it on a trillion different things? Right, and you know, it's not just an American thing. Worldwide, according to this worldwide poll, a quarter of adults worldwide say they feel lonely. And so for as far as Americans, things that they do when they feel lonely, okay, 50% find a distraction like TV, podcasts, or social media. 41% go on a walk. 38% reach out to friends or family. 31% connect to a pet. 31% exercise. 26% eat more than usual. 13% use drugs or alcohol when they feel lonely. And then et cetera, et cetera. So David, we're here to talk about is this an epidemic we've witnessed and what can people do about it? What are some main reactions? Well, uh, some of the main reactions are, number one, society is collapsing from within and everybody is saying a hundred different reasons, right? Some people think it's the breakdown of the family unit. Some people think it's a lack of uh, religiosity. Some people think we're just moving too far into this AI digital metaverse realm that we all could live in, right? Ah! Uh, the ready, the ready player one future, right? So there's right. a lot of people blaming it on a lot of different things. This is reaction number two, Andrew. This is how every generation in a dip extrapolates the trends, but we always bounce out of it. So some people are saying, you guys always think everything's the end of the world. Because in 1976, Andrew, there was a movie post-Vietnam War uh, called Taxi, where Robert De Niro played a hyper-depressed guy, very sad at the shape of society. And America bounced out of that into like the roaring 80s and 90s, right? Right. So actually, there's oh, in almost every point in time, especially that there's been media, there has been some feeling from some group of people that the world is on the verge of ending or America's on the verge of crumbling. Or or, or every 25 years, there's basically like a, a cycle that's like a low point and we might be in a low point right now and we think that that trend is going to extrapolate downwards. But basically, Peter Zahan and some other people, these are hot take artists. I'm not saying they're all right, but they said that it's like, you're just at the bottom of the dip, but you're just going to shoot back up. Yeah, I mean, I think there is some truth to it that if you look, there's always people who are predicting the end. The end is, the end has always been near 
my entire life, David. People have been saying the end is near either from a religious biblical standpoint, people were saying the end is near, or they were just even just non-biblically, people are just saying, oh, right. America is destroying right. itself. Well, what's well, a great way to get attention, Andrew, and to be honest, make money. Right. It's, it's selling the, the, the FUD, right? Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's based on true things that people see but the extrapolation is that the world is going to end and it's always been ending. So, right, right, right. And the reason why people are able to sell the FUD, Andrew, this is a third reaction, which is a little bit more of like examining the psyche of the American people, saying that Americans are just crazy and prone to overreaction like spoiled children. Because mm. somebody was saying America had such a great last 250 years that they're sort of spoiled by history and that's why they overreact, almost like a kid who grew up in a really rich family and then they don't get like the car they want on their sweet 16 and it's almost like their world is collapsing based off what they've known in their life right right and then uh a last reaction that I feel like is also part of it, and maybe all these reactions are partially true, David, is that perception is skewed and that comparison culture is the thief of joy, meaning that to in today's world, people what people think is lonely and what they define as lonely to themselves is not actually that bad as compared to decades before, but it's because of social media and you see all these things or all these people living these crazy lives with mm -hmm. all these friends on the yachts, at the parties, knowing famous people, and you see all this and that makes you more depressed because you're comparing it to your life. But in actuality, like decades before, people had the same amount of friends you did and they didn't consider themselves lonely. Yeah, well, you just didn't know about anybody else's life and you weren't comparing yourself to, you know, whether it's real or imagined or exaggerated, other people's curated life. Yeah, and and I'll be honest, the truth is, yes, di people did go to church more often. People did have third spaces more often in decades before. We all do know that the third space, right, of your life, not your home, not work, your third right. space that you hang out at, has been decreasing over the past few yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. I think that we've been moving away from the tribal, village, parochial way of life, and maybe we're moving away from it at, like, hyper speed now. But you could argue that if you look at a lot of cultures, Andrew, there's cultures like, for example, uh, some Latin American countries, the Philippines, not necessarily the highest ranked on income statistics, but generally their contentment and their happiness and loneliness stats are pretty good. Right. Because they have... The things that, you know what I mean? That yeah, humans no, had in the past. Like, dude, for like, sure. Yeah. Sometimes loneliness or isolation runs the opposite to, I mean, runs along with achievement. Like, it, it's a positive correlation. Sometimes the more stressed and harder working you are or higher achieving you are, then you are more stressed out and more lonely. Right, right. Possible. Specifically, East Asian countries do not rank super high on happiness all the time because right. there's so much pressure. Interestingly enough, though, Andrew, Scandinavian countries, they do rank high. Yeah, you mean on loneliness? No, uh, at least on, from what I see in happiness metrics, I don't know, man, you, you see competing reports, right? right. Because uh, like you said, man, maybe, maybe they're happy about some things, but they lack sun up there too. Mm. So that, that's true too. Do we think Asians are lonelier than the average person? There are some stats out here from the TAF status report saying 38% of Asian Americans uh, feel like they belong in the US. Obviously that's related to loneliness. This isn't, quite the exact same question, but I'm saying basically if you don't feel accepted or you don't feel like you belong, then that can lead to some form of loneliness, right? If you don't have a community, you don't have a physical place to go to. Yeah, I think that that's uh, definitely part of it too. I don't know, man. It's so tough to say, like, like I said, some of these studies that we saw, they were focusing on middle-aged. Some people were focusing on older age, like 60 plus. But then there was a ton of people on the internet saying that this is a global problem, even of the youth due to social media. But then, like we said, there's three different types of connectedness, Andrew. Tier one is feeling joy and acceptance from a physical community. Tier two is feeling joy and acceptance from a non-physical community. Maybe it could be an internet community. And number three is not feeling like you belong anywhere right yeah and i i think that like a lot of people are just uh uh they're feeling a lot of maybe tier two and i mean i guess tier three man because just physical communities are breaking down david right, uh, right. what are what are a lot of the deep cut comments all saying right, on all right. so you're right so it's interesting because scandinavian countries they do rank high in terms of life satisfaction and happiness but they do also rank high on loneliness like they were saying switzerland nordic countries uh, a good portion of Asian cold places typically rank high on social isolation. Mm. 
Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I guess it's cold. But then, like, maybe Mongolia and Siberia don't. Like, in Yakutia, that's in the middle of, like, the Russian tundra. But they're probably sharing a lot of community together, to be honest. Um, somebody saying, like, all the top comments are blaming completely different things, and it's very sad that they're all correct. Basically, it's everything. It's our entire flow of life, living in the suburbs far away from each other, not even knowing your own neighbors, and then sitting down on your couch and watching hours of TV every night. Mm. Yeah? This is, of course, blaming the suburbs. What do you think about everybody blaming the suburbs? Because the suburbs used to be a symbolism of, like, the apex of American life in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, right? Getting away from, at that time, urban blight. And then now it almost seems like people are ishing on the suburb lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think in any situation, if you don't know your neighbors and you don't have uh, any sort of interactions with them, whether you're in the city or the suburbs, that's not a good sign, you know? And I think that a lot of people feel like uh, they don't want to reach out to their neighbor because they have their online community. They have their small physical community that they go to. And instead, they'd rather not ping with the people that are immediately around them, whether or not that's their tribe or not. You know what I mean? Right. This guy says, I'm blaming it on car-centric infrastructure, suburban single-family dwelling zoning, capitalism, late-stage capitalism, the degradation of the church, which is the most prominent third place. So it doesn't have to be the church, but here's the thing about it. And it doesn't have to be like any sort of religion. I'm just using church as a word here. Basically, Andrew, you know what religion does do though? And, and, and go into a place of worship does do, and I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm just providing some logic here. It gives you intrinsic motivation, Andrew, because it makes you believe in yourself and a higher power. But then it actually gives you a physical community that, that has like a, a moral obligation to think about you. Right. Like, they, like, it's not just people milling around like at your job. Like, I guess at a job, if you do enough team building, it could mimic that. But like, they have to care about you because you're a member of that organization, the religious organization. Right, right. So I'm saying, isn't that, isn't that two birds with one stone? So I'm saying that most people in America are not religious anymore. So that's two stones that are missing. Yeah, no. And, and, and the church is one of the oldest kind of organizations out there uh, where you tithe or whatever your version is, or you donate to the church or whether it's a And then, that must mean you believe in it if you give money to it, right? Yeah, where at least it's, it's not like, it, sometimes it's a strict membership fee. Sometimes it's not strict. Sometimes it's just, you know, you donate at your own pace. But it's like, essentially, you have to commit something to this group. And in return, this group is gonna, you come here, you have a meal, you can talk to people, make friends, join the small uh, group, share join your, the uh, barbecue. Trying to solve your traumas. or Right, trying to help you out with possible... Uh, um, family issues. And of course, churches are not perfect because they're made by humans. So of course there's errors, flaws, and bad things that happen. But generally that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to be a positive place where everybody goes on Sunday or Saturday or whatever day it is. You go to your temple or church and you're supposed to be a nice person. You're supposed to have community. You're in that community mindset. Maybe not even seven no, days a yeah, week, yeah, are you? Yeah, that might be like the one day a week where you don't be an a-hole. Or you yeah, try not to be. Exactly. So some of that being built into an organization is not bad, guys. That's actually kind of a good thing. Sometimes you need those things that tell you like, hey, well, time to put on a tie and... Act like a nice person, even though maybe I'm not the nicest person in my heart, right. but that's my duty. And that's why some Sundays. companies, I think, and I'm not promoting them at all. I don't even want to, but some companies were adopting that landmark program almost as a, a built-in church into a company. Sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and listen. I'm not saying that they, yeah, there was like some complaints, but you know, Andrew, it could be for anything. Some people say CrossFit is a cult. You know what I mean? Like, you know how like different people like yeah. adopt like these different run, you know, the, the most, think about the most fervent run club guy, you know, he's treating it as if that's his religion. No, no, replacement, I, you know? I got it. Like clubs with high buy-in makes sense. Like, let's say you're lazy your entire week. And then on Saturday mornings, you got this CrossFit group and you're like, I got to act like a CrossFit no, no, guy. No, cause I'm, I'm a, turning up. No, I'm a team leader. Yeah. Within that squad, right? Or if you go to the nightclub and it's like, guys, I usually don't like to party and drink, but when I go to the nightclub, I got to be this social person. I got to spend a little bit of money because that's the rules. That's what you're supposed to do. Oh, oh that's why people uh, join the infrastructure, become a promoter for 
uh, or yeah. for a venue or something yeah, like that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. This guy said, also, though, we can't ignore the huge variety of highly stimulating entertainment. Mm. Basically, this is most more stimulating at many levels more than any entertainment has ever been before. Entertainment is becoming from the 2D to the 3D to the 4D. So, of course, that's going to give people the impression it could substitute for human interaction. Yeah, man. Uh, there's a lot of content out there. I'm not going to lie, though. A lot of those Netflix original movies are whack, so don't watch them. But anyways, like, yeah, there's David. I mean, there's you can spend your whole week literally shut indoors consuming YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, streaming, any of the crunchy roll, whatever you want. You can just keep going. Yeah. Right, right, right. And I guess like their job isn't to make sure you have a balanced life. Like there's no oh. timer on those entertainment platforms that's like, maybe you should go outside and get a sufficient amount of human oh. pings. Oh, what if, what if after every show, uh, there was like this box that came up and said, would you like to video chat with other people who just watched the show? And then there's like a chat room, but a video chat room where you like, Video chat with other people about the... I don't know if that would help, but... Right. I guess maybe that's the appeal of, like, why people do Omegle or, like, Twitch or, like, all these, like, things yeah. that, you know, how like, people who get their pings in a 90s analog way are just like, wow, why, yeah, why do I do gotta, Yeah, I do gotta admit, as much as we're not into streaming ourselves, streaming at least does have that interactive uh, aspect where you're in a chat with other people. You're not really having a conversation, but you are kind of talking to the person streaming, so... Right, right, right. I mean, ultimately, guys, we could get... I'm sure there's, like, some factors that we overlooked. Listen, guys, like, if you guys look online, there's about, like, 50 posts with 100 replies each. So that means 5,000 replies on this topic, and a lot of people think putting the emphasis on this reason, that reasoning. Ultimately, I think that it's, like, when you move away from the village mindset and the parochialness of human life that was that way for, like, thousands and thousands and thousands of years... I just think that we are still figuring out how to live in this like hybrid digital IRL le level. And to your point, Andrew, Andrew, the older people that were depressed in some of the studies earlier, the middle aged and older people, they might feel left out of the digital community. Mm. And they feel like the world is shifting towards that or like all the, you know what I mean? The resources and sort of the focus of the world is shifting away from that. But they're still like on like bowling and bingo night. Yeah. But then where's bingo? Do you see anybody do it anymore? Who killed Bingo? I mean, yeah. And I think that, do you think there's also maybe some like bad actors in society, Andrew, that made digital online life seem more appealing than IRL life? Uh, yeah, I do think when everybody thought that the world became very dangerous and they don't want to go outside and getting Uber Eats and watching Netflix for two nights straight is actually just a safer way to enjoy life. That does suck. And that's why crime and chaos is a bad thing for society because if there's crime and fear outside when you go outside then you're not going to want to go outside and have a community that's the right. truth you know what i mean so you have to feel safe to some level and is, uh, is it true that you see less kids play outside nowadays it, it feels like that's it. what everybody says yeah i don't have and kids myself you, yet. you know what i've seen too is a rise in like premium third spaces like a you know like a lifetime or equinox like hyper expensive buy-in gyms because you feel like your phone's not going to get stolen if you're like bench pressing whereas like a at a planet fitness you can't guarantee it. Right. I wouldn't leave my phone around a plan of fitness. Right, right. Do you know what I'm saying? So everything's moving up market. And I don't know, guys, what can be done? I'm not bigger than society. I would say find community, though. If you like feel yourself drifting into the ready player one thing and you want to have more physical community, find it however you can. Obviously, hopefully you find it in a more productive way. Yeah, I would really recommend people uh, do one activity for their mental in like a mental group, like a mental aspect, and then one for a physical group. Like you gotta be doing some type of physical activity with a group at least twice a month. I think so. Like that's almost in a, a minimum requirement for an adult, even if you work. And plus a lot of people work from home now. They only go in the office mm. two, three times a week. So you got right, to get out. I got it, man. Touch the, touch the caveman Neanderthal mind. Touch the caveman Neanderthal mind. Like you said, getting together, people probably were like, building villages out of sticks and stuff like that and like trying to gather wood for the fire and that probably gave, made people not feel lonely because everybody was trying to do it 
Yeah. Anyway, guys, let us know what you think in the comment section below. Um, what are the reasons? Do you feel lonely or do you feel like you feel a lot more lonely than your, uh, your parents or the older generations did? What are the reasons behind it and what can people do about it to fix it? Until next time, we the Hot Pot Boys. We out. Peace. Peace.